Okay, here is the second part of the reading for the 3.05 lesson, starting with a growing, changing nation. In 1800, the United States was overwhelmingly a rural, rural nation. Only about 5% of its people lived in cities, and compared to the European counterparts, many of these cities were little more than towns. At a time when nearly a million people lived in London, the largest city in the United States, Philadelphia, had a population of roughly 70,000, followed by New York with about 60,000. The new national capital of Washington, D.C. had a population of a little more than 3,000. Although the United States was sparsely populated, its population was rising fast. The number of Americans increased by more than a third between 7, 1790 and 1801, from 3.9 million to 5.3 million. At the same time, the nation rapidly expanded westward as many people sought new land to settle and farm. The frontier territories of Kentucky and Tennessee became states in the 1790s, tripling in population within a decade. But because overland transportation was poor, western fam farmers found it difficult to get their crops to market. They began to lie in a water route, shipping their produce down the Mississippi River and through the port of New Orleans. The growing importance of New Orleans helped bring about... The most remarkable land deal in American history, one that doubled the size of the nation at the stroke of a pen. And let's look at the map here for a moment. This is going to show us what um, all the country that, or the, all the land that was purchased as part of the Louisiana Purchase is what we're going to read about next. All this middle yellowish, um, goldish color there in, in the middle of the map. That's all that was purchased by the Louisiana Purchase. The Louisiana Purchase. In 1800, New Orleans belonged to Spain. It was part of a vast Spanish territory called Louisiana, stretching from the Mississippi to the Rockies, and roughly the size of the existing United States. By treaty, American ships had the right of deposit, the right to offload cargoes in the port. But in 1801, word reached President Jefferson of a secret deal by which Spain was to cede Louisiana to France. The news alarmed Jefferson because of what he knew of France's ruler, Napoleon Bonaparte. In the 1790s, Napoleon had been a brilliant general, leading the French army to victory after victory over France's enemies in Europe. But in 1799, he seized power in a coup, proclaiming himself first consul and becoming in effect a military dictator of France. Jefferson, who had thought Napoleon a great man while he served the cause of the French Revolution, now decided that he was a great scoundrel only. The power-mad Napoleon dreamed of ruling empires in both Europe and the Americas. Jefferson thought it was critical that Napoleon not be allowed to choke to choke off Western America's Western commerce by gaining control of New Orleans. Jefferson sent a close political ally, Robert Livingston, to Paris to try to negotiate the sale of New Orleans to the United States. At first, the French rejected Livingston's appeals. Discussions dragged on for the next two years, and Jefferson sent James Monroe, a fellow Virginian, to join Livingston. Meanwhile, Napoleon had been so busily plotting new wars in Europe that he gradually gave up his ambition for an empire in the Americas. In April 1803, Livingston and Monroe received a stunning offer. The United States could buy not just New Orleans, but all of Louisiana territory for the sum of $15 million, or less than $0.04 cents an acre. This news both delighted and troubled Jefferson. By agreeing to the Louisiana Purchase, he would be acquiring a vast new territory for the nation at a bargain price and ensuring the vitality of farming and commerce in the West. But Jefferson had always insisted that the federal government could only act as the Constitution said it could, and nothing in the Constitution authorized it to buy territory from foreign countries. He had denounced the broad construction of the Constitution by the Federalists, but this was an opportunity too precious to pass up. Jefferson set, abide his qualms, set aside his qualms about the constitutionality of the purchase. After a treaty was signed, he presented it to the Senate, which ratified it to widespread rejoicing. Peacefully and at relatively low cost, Jefferson has succeeded in doubling the size of the nation. It would be the greatest triumph of his presidency, though he achieved it by compromising one of his firmest political principles. Lewis and Clark and the Corps of Discovery Most Americans, including Jefferson himself, knew almost nothing about the vast new territory they had suddenly acquired. To remedy that, Jefferson gave two young army officers, Meriwether Lewis and William Clark, an ambitious mis mission. They were set to... They were to set off westward to explore the land and to attempt to locate the Northwest Passage, an all-water route linking the Atlantic to the Pacific. They were to map the regions they passed through, describe the plants and animals they saw, and make alliances with the Indian tribes they encountered. All these actions were intended to lay the foundation for future American settlement. 
With a company of soldiers that came to be known as the Corps of Discovery, Lewis and Clark set out from St. Louis in May 1804, sailing in small boats up the Missouri River. As they crossed the future states of Missouri, Nebraska, and South and North Dakota, Clark made maps, while Lewis kept detailed notes on plants and animal life. Lewis was intrigued to come across strange new plants like coyotes, strange new animals like coyotes and prairie dogs, which he called barking squirrels. Twice Lewis was attacked and nearly killed by grizzly bears, which as he noted were far more aggressive and dangerous than the black bears of the east. For the most part, however, Lewis recorded his sheer wonder at the wildlife of the Great Plains. I ascended to the top of the Cup Bluff this morning, from whence I had the most delightful view of immense herds of buffalo, elk, deer, antelopes feeding on one common and boundless pasture. Lewis and Clark brought along small gifts, medals, scissors, mirrors to distribute among the Native Americans they met. They declared that the settlers who followed them would come in peace, wanting only trade with the Indians. For the most part, the Indians they met were receptive, although hostilities nearly broke out when a group of Sioux felt insulted by the paltriness of the explorers' gifts. The expedition spent the winter of 1804 through 1805 as neighbors of an especially hospitable tribe, the Mandans. In a nearby village, Lewis and Clark met Sacagawea, the one young wife of a Canadian trader. Sacagawea, who belonged to the Shoshone tribe with his homeland in the Rocky Mountains, agreed to be the Americans' guide and interpreter as they proceeded west. In May 1805, the members of the expedition came within sight of the Rockies. Lewis recorded that his pleasure at the sight of the towering snow-covered peaks was balanced by his realization of how hard they would be to cross. By now, the expedition had discovered there was no easy water route across the American continent. By the time they crossed the Rockies, the members of the expedition were exhausted and weakened by hunger and disease. We suffered everything, Lewis later wrote, that cold hunger and fatigue could impart. But their spirits rose as they made their way across the Columbian River, Columbia River toward the Pacific Ocean. On a misty day in early November 1805, they heard a sound of surf breaking against rocks. Then the mist cleared and Clark scribbled in his journal, journal Ocean in view, oh the joy. They had reached the Pacific and fulfilled their mission. When Lewis and Clark returned the following year, Jefferson was disappointed to learn that explorers had not found the Northwest Passage waterway. But he was delighted with Clark for having filled in the map of America's new territories and with Lewis for describing all their plant and animal life in such captivating detail. It would remain for future waves of pioneers, in Jefferson's word, to fill up the canvas we begin. All right, let's go back to the lesson. I guess I read a little extra there. Um, I read an extra page about the Lewis and Clark expedition, but then you're saved from that the next time. Okay, so don't forget to go back to your reading guide. Remember to use that, fill it out um, from the material we just read, and then to check your answers with the, le check, um, the lesson answer key. Now we also have to complete these other things, the election of 1800 and the how many and where activities. So let's continue on and the checkpoint as well. So Thomas Jeffers Jefferson's presidency. Let's read about this. Okay, we have to, when you finish the assignment, the reading assignment, which we have, complete the election of 1800 online activity. <clears throat> you might think Thomas Jefferson's election was to the presidency a slam dunk, an overwhelming landslide given in part of the declaration, given his part in the Declaration of Independence and his role as Secretary of State and then as Vice President. Not so. Jefferson's election was so complicated that a constitutional amendment followed. See what happens if you fill in the blanks regarding this process. Okay, let's continue on. You may be used to hearing about red and blue states in today's election process. Now let's take a look at the yellow and green states of the 1800 election and the voting chart of the electoral vote. Who won? Okay, this is kind of small print, isn't it? But let's take a look at it here. So if you look at the map, who won? It's the green, and the green was the Democratic Republicans, which was um, Jefferson and Burr. So, um, it's kind of a tie, but if you put Jefferson, there you go. Next. Did you say Thomas Jefferson won? It's true he became president, but did you notice that he did not win the electoral vote? He tied. Not with other not with the other nominee for vice for president, but with his own running mate Burr. At the time the electors could only vote for president, not vice president. However, each elector had two votes. The man with the most votes became president, and the man who came in second became vice president, regardless of his political party. So if Thomas Jefferson had gotten 73 electoral votes and John Adams had gotten 72 and Aaron Burr had gotten 71, then Jefferson would have been president and Adams wouldn't have been his vice president. Okay, so we needed to uh, fill in the blank here. The other nominee for president was John Adams. Let's check. That's correct. But because, 
But because both Jefferson and Byrd tied with 73 each, it was up to the House of Representatives to break the tie. Eventually they did, but not without the help of Federalist Alexander Hamilton, who thought Jefferson the better candidate. As a Federalist, Hamilton actually preferred neither, since both Jefferson and Byrd were members of what party? Look at it here on the map, or on the, the graph. Jefferson and Byrd were both members of the Democratic-Republican Party. Confused yet? It may or may not be, but there was enough general confusion over this election that an amendment to the Constitution changed the process. Ratified in 1804, the What Amendment requires electors to select a president and a vice president. That was the 12th Amendment. Do you remember that from the reading? Today, there is still controversy about the Electoral College. Some people believe the popular vote should decide the president election, but it does not. Four presidents have lost the popular vote and won the presidency because of the electoral process. They are John Quincy Adams, Rutherford B. Hayes, Benjamin Harrison, and George W. Bush. And that's the end of this little election of 1800 activities. So let's move on. How many and where? In April of 1803, the United States purchased Louisiana Territory, du effectively doubling the geographic size of the nation. Do you wonder what happened to the population around this time? Do you think it had doubled since the first year of Washington's presidency? Check out some fast facts about the census taken in 1800. Use the chart at the Census Bureau to help you begin answering the questions of how many and where sheet. And here's the how many and where sheet. You also may have gotten that earlier when you downloaded your lesson resources, and you're going to use the information on the Census Bureau uh, website to answer that. And this is what it's going to look like, and you're going to go through the sheet and complete it to the best of your ability. It's not handed in, it's just an extra, um, you know, to learn about the demographics of the nation, and you can check your answers as well on this on the lesson answer key. And then you have, lastly, the checkpoint. So don't forget to do the checkpoint at the end, and then you'll be done with the 305 lesson. Good luck.